Pursuit by Lester Del Rey. Chapter One Fear Cut Through the Unconscious Mind of Wilbur Hawkes. With almost physical violence, it tightened his throat and knifed at his heart. It darted into his numbed brain, screaming at him. He was a soft egg in a vast globe of elastic gelatin. Two creatures swam menacingly through the resisting globe toward him. The gelatin fought against them, but they came on. One was near and made a mystic pass. He screamed at it, and the gelatin grew stronger, throwing them back and away. Suddenly the creatures drew back. A door opened, and they were gone. But he couldn't let them go. If they escaped... Hawks jerked upright in his bed, gasping out a hoarse cry, and the sound of his own voice completed the awakening. He opened his eyes to the murky darkness that was barely relieved by the little nightlight. For a second the nightmare was so strong on his mind that he seemed to see two shadows beyond the door, rushing down the steps. He fought off the illusion, and with straining senses jerked his head around the room. There was nothing there. Sweat was beating on his forehead, and he could feel his pulse racing. He had to get out. Had to leave at once he forced the idea aside there was something cloudy in his mind and he made reason take over and shove away some of the heavy fear his fingers found a cigarette and lighted it automatically the first familiar breath of smoke in his lungs helped he drew in deeply again while the tiny sounds in the room became meaningful there was the incessant ticking of the clock and the soft shushing sound of a tape recorder he stared at the machine, running on fast rewind, and reversed it to play, but the tape seemed to be blank or erased. He crushed the cigarette out on the tabletop where other butts lay in disorder. It looked wrong, and his mind leaped up in sudden frantic fear before he could calm it again. This time reason echoed his emotional unease. Hawks had never smoked before but his fingers were already lighting another by old habit. His thoughts lurched, seeking for an answer. There was only a vague sense of something missing. A period of time seemed to have passed. It felt like a long period, but he had no memory of it. There had been the final fight with Irma. Then he'd gone stalking out of the house, telling her to get a divorce any way she wanted. He'd opened the mailbox and taken out a letter. A letter from a professor. His mind refused to go any further. There was only a complete blank after that. But it had been in midwinter, and now he could make out the faint outlines of full-leaved trees against the sky through the window. Months had gone by, and there was no faintest trace of them in his mind. They'll get you. You can't escape. Hurry. Go. Go. The cigarette fell from his shaking hands, and he was half out of the bed before the rational part of his mind could cut off the fear thoughts. He flipped on the light, afraid of the darkness. It didn't help. The room was dusty, as if unused for months, and there was a cobweb in one corner by the mirror. His own face shocked him. It was the same lean, sharp-figured face as ever, under a shock of nondescript sandy hair. His ears stuck out too much and his lips were a trifle too thin. It looked no more than his thirty years, but it was a strained face now, painted with weeks of fatigue and grayish with fear, sweat streaked, and with nervous tension in every corded tendon of his throat. His somewhat bony, average-height figure shook visibly as he climbed from the bed. Hawk stood fighting himself, trying to get back in the bed, but it was a losing battle something seemed to swing up from the corners of the room as if a shadow moved he jerked his head toward it but there was nothing there he heard his breath rasp harshly and his knuckles whitened there was a taste of blood in the corner of his mouth where he was biting his lips get out they'll be here at once leave go his hands were already fumbling with his underclothing he drew on briefs jerkily and grabbed for a shirt and suit he had never seen before. He was no longer thinking now. Blind panic was winning. He thrust his feet into shoes, not bothering with socks. 
A slip of paper fell from his coat with big, scrawled Greek letters. He saw only the last line as it fell to the floor, some equation that ended with the infinity sign. Then, psi and alpha connected by a dash. The alpha sign had been scratched out and something written over it. He tried to reach it, and more paper spilled from his coat pocket. The fear washed up more strongly. He forgot the papers. Even the cigarettes were too far away for him to return to them. His wallet lay on the chair, and he barely grabbed it before the urge overpowered him completely. The doorknob slipped in his sweaty hands, but he managed to turn it. The elevator wasn't at his floor, and he couldn't stop for it. His feet pounded on the stairs, taking him down the three floors to the street at a breakneck pace. The walls of the stairway seemed to rush together, as if trying to close the way. He screamed at them until they were behind, and he was charging out of the front door. A half-drunken couple was coming in, a fat old man and a slim girl he barely saw. He hit them, throwing them aside. He jerked from the entrance. Cars were streaming down West End Avenue. He dashed across, paying no attention to them. His rush carried him onto the opposite sidewalk. Then, finally, the blank panic left him, and he was leaning against a building, gasping for breath, and wondering whether his heart could endure the next beat. Across the street, the fat man he had hit was coming after him. Hawks gathered himself together to apologize, but the words never came. A second blinding horror hit at him, and his eyes darted upward to the windows of his apartment. It was only a tiny glow at first, like a drop from the heart of a sun. Then, before he could more than blink, it spread until the whole apartment seemed to blaze. A gout of smoke poured from the shattered window, and a dull concussion struck his ears. The infernally bright flame flickered leaped outward from the window and died down almost as quickly as it had come leaving twisted half molten metal where the window frames had been they'd almost gotten him hawks felt his legs weaken and quiver while his eyes remained glued to the spot that had lighted the whole street a second before they'd tried but he'd escaped in time it must have been a thermite bomb nothing but thermite could be that hot he had never imagined that even such a bomb could give so much heat so quickly. Where? In the tape recorder? He waited numbly, expecting more fire, but the brief flame seemed to have died out completely. He shook his head, unbelievingly, and started to cross the street again, to survey the damage, or to join the crowd that was beginning to collect. Fear surged up in him again halting his steps as if he'd struck a physical barrier. With it came the sound of an auto horn, the button held down permanently. His eyes darted down the street to see a long, gray sedan with old-fashioned running boards coming around the corner on two wheels. Its brakes screeched, and it skidded to a halt beside Hawk's apartment building. A slim young man in gray tweeds leapt out of it and came to a stop. He threw back heavy black hair with a toss of his head and ran into the crowd that parted to let him through. Someone began pointing toward Hawks. Hawks tried to slide around the corner without being seen, but a flashlight in the young man's hand pinpointed him. A yell went up. There he goes! His feet sounded hopelessly on the sidewalk as he dashed up toward Broadway, but behind came the sound of others in pursuit and the shouting was becoming a meaningless babble as others took it up. There was no longer any doubt. Someone was certainly after him. There'd been no time to turn in an alarm over the fire in his apartment. They'd been coming for him before that started. What hideous crime had he committed during the period he couldn't remember? Or what spy ringing had encircled him? He had no time to think of the questions, even. He ducked into a thin swarm of a few people leaving a theater, just as the pursuing group rounded the corner, with the slim young man in the lead. Their cries were enough. Hands reached for him from the theater crowd, and a foot stretched out to trip him up. 
terror lent speed to his legs but he could never outdistance them as long as others picked up the chase a sudden blast of heat struck down and the air was golden and hazy above him he staggered sideways blinded by the glare the crowd was screaming in fear now no longer holding him back he felt the edge of a subway entrance there was no other choice he ducked down the steps while his vision slowly returned and risked a glance back at the street just as the whole entrance came down in a wreck of broken wood and metal a clap of thundering noise sounded above him drowning out the hoarse screams of the people the few persons in the station rushed for the fallen entrance to mill about it crazily just as the train pulled in hawk started toward it and then realized his pursuers would suspect that whatever frightful weapon had been used against him had backfired on them but they'd catch him at the next stop he found a space at the end of the platform and dropped off skirting behind the train and avoiding the high voltage rails the uptown platform held only three people and they seemed to be too busy at the other end trying to see the wreckage to notice him he vaulted onto it and dashed into the men's room the few contents of his coat pocket came out quickly and he began to stuff them into his trousers he shoved the coat into a garbage can wet his hair and slicked it back and opened his shirt collar the change didn't make much of a disguise but they wouldn't be expecting him to show up so near where he entered his skin prickled as he came out but he fought down the sickness in his stomach a few drops of rain were beginning to fall and the crowd around the accident was thinning out that might help him or it might prove more dangerous he had to chance it he stopped to buy a paper maintaining an air of casual interest in the crowd what happened he asked the newsstand attendant jerked his eyes back from the excitement reluctantly damned if i know someone said ball lightning came down and broke over there caved in the entrance nobody's hurt seriously they say i was just stacking up to go home when i heard it go off didn't see it just saw the entrance fall in hawks picked up his change and turned back across broadway pretending he was studying the paper the dateline showed it was july 10th just seven months from the beginning of his memory lapse he couldn't believe that there had been time enough for any group to invent a heat ray if such a thing could exist yet nothing else would explain the two sudden bursts of flame he had seen even if it could be invented it could hardly be used in public for anything less than a national emergency what had happened in the seven blanked out months end of chapter one of pursuit by lester del rey chapter two of pursuit by lester del rey the room was smelly and cheap with dirty walls and no carpet on the floor but it was a relief after the hours of tramping and riding about the city hawks sat on a rickety chair letting the wetness dry out of his clothes he looked at the bed trying to convince himself that he could strip and warm up there while his clothes dried but something in his head warned him that he couldn't he'd have to be ready to run again the same urge had made him demand a room on the ground floor where he could escape through the window if they found him they could never find him here but they would sooner or later whatever was after him would come it had seemed simple enough before there had been three friends he could trust seven months he had felt couldn't have killed their faith in him no matter what he'd done and perhaps he'd been right though there'd been no chance to test it he'd almost been caught at the first place the two men outside had seemed to be no more than a couple of friends waiting for a bus only the approach of another man who resembled hawks had tipped him off by the quick interest they had shown 
the other places had also been posted and beyond the third he'd seen the gray sedan with the running boards parked back in the shadows waiting there had been less than ten dollars in his wallet and most of that had gone for cab fares he'd barely had enough left for this dingy room the late edition of the newspaper and the coffee and doughnuts which lay beside him half consumed he glanced toward the door listening with quick fear as the steps sounded on the stairs then he drew his breath in again and reached for the newspaper but it told him as little as the first one had this one mentioned the two mysterious explosions of ball lightning in a feature on the first page but only as a curiosity they even gave his address and listed the apartment as being in his name though apparently not currently occupied but no other reference was made to him or to the chase he shook his head at that he couldn't see a newspaper man refusing to make a story of it if there was any other news about him to which they could tie the burning of his apartment apparently it was not the police who were after him and he hadn't been guilty of anything so ordinary as murder outside the window a sudden scream sounded and he jerked from the chair reaching the door before he realized it was only a cat on the prowl he shuddered his old hatred of cats coming to the surface for a minute he thought of shutting the window but he couldn't cut off his chance to retreat through the garbage littered backyard he returned to his search beginning an inventory of the few belongings that had been in his pocket there was a notebook and he scanned it rapidly a few pages were missing and most were blank there was only a shopping list that puzzled him for a minute he couldn't believe he'd taken to using lipstick as well as cigarettes though both were listed in his handwriting the notebook contained nothing else he stuffed it back into his pockets along with his key ring there were more keys than he'd expected some of which were strange to him but none held any mark that would identify them he put a few pennies into another pocket his entire wealth now in a world where no more money would be available to him he grimaced dropping a comb into the same pocket then there was only his wallet left his identification card was there unchanged behind it where his wife's picture had always been there was only a folded clipping he drew it out hoping for a clue it was only an announcement of people killed in an airline crash and among those found dead was mrs wilbur hawks of new york it seemed that irma had never reached reno for the divorce he tried to feel sorrow at that but time had healed whatever hurt there had been even though he couldn't remember she had hated him ever since she'd found that he really wasn't willing to please his father by becoming another of the vice presidents in the old man's bank with an unearned but fancy salary he'd preferred teaching mathematics and dabbling with a bit of research into the probable value of the esp work being done at duke university he'd explained why he hated banking irma had made it clear that she really needed a mink coat no assistant professor could afford it had been stalemate a bitter seven-year stalemate until she finally gave up hope and demanded a divorce he threw the clipping away and pulled out a final bit of paper it was a rent receipt for a cold water apartment on the poorer section of west end from the price of eighteen dollars a month it had to be a cold water place he frowned considering it apartment twelve that might explain why his own apartment had been unused though it made little sense to him it would probably be watched by now anyway he jerked to his feet at the sound on the window sill but it was only a cat eyeing the unfinished doughnut he threw the food out and the cat dived after it hawks waited for the touch of ice along his backbone to go away this time he tried to ignore it he picked up the paper and began going through it looking for something that might give him some slight clue but there was nothing there 
only a heading on the inside page that stirred his curiosity scientist seeks confinement he glanced at it noting that a professor Meinzer, formerly of city college had appeared at bellevue asking to be put away in a padded cell preferably with a straitjacket the professor had only explained that he considered himself dangerous to society no other reason was found professor Meinzer had been doing private work believed to be related to his theory that the panic was back thick in hawk's throat he jerked back against the wall his heart racing while he tried to fight it down there was no sound from the hall or outside he forced his eyes back to the paper and the paper was surrounded by a golden haze it burst into a momentary flame as the haze flickered out hawks dropped the ashes from his clammy hands he hadn't been burned you can't escape run they'll get you he heard the outside door open as it had opened a hundred times but now it could only mean that more were coming he jerked for the open window something came sailing through the air to hit the sill hawks screamed weakly far down in his throat before his eyes could register the fact that it was only the cat again then the cat let out a horrible beginning of a sound and its poor half-starved body seemed to turn inside out with a churning motion that hawks could barely see blood and gore spattered from it striking his face and clothes he froze unable to move either they were outside in the yard or whatever frightful weapon they used could work through a closed door he tried to move first one way then the other his feet remained frozen then steps sounded in the hallway and he waited no longer his legs came suddenly to life hurling him over the carcass of the cat and outside he went charging through the refuge and then leaped and clawed his way over the fence the alley was deserted and he shot down it to swing right and into another alley it wasn't until his muscles began to fail that he could control himself enough to stop and stumble into a darkened spot among the garbage cans spent and gasping for breath there was no sign of anyone following hawks had no idea how they could trace him but he was beginning to suspect that nothing was impossible judging by the results of their weapons for a moment though he seemed to have shaken off pursuit and the physical fatigue had apparently eased some of his terror what had shocked him into losing seven months out of his memory and still could drive him into absolute terror at the first sign of them he couldn't go back to the room and his own apartment was out of the question the rain had stopped mercifully but he couldn't walk the streets indefinitely dirty and bedraggled as he was he tried to think of something to do but all his schemes took money which he no longer had finally he arose wearily maybe the apartment for which he had the rent receipt was watched but he'd have to chance it there was no place else he had been accidentally heading toward it and he continued now sticking to the alleys until he reached west end avenue he tried to hurry but the best his tired muscles could do was a slow shuffle light was beginning to show faintly in the sky but it was still too early for more than a few cars and a chance pedestrian at this hour the avenue was used by only a few cruising cabs heading toward better sections he shuffled along trying to look like a man on his way home after too much night out the cat blood on his clothes bothered him until he tried weaving a little as he walked imitating the drunks he has seen often enough he passed an all-night diner and fished for his pennies but there were several men inside he went on past 59th street heading for the apartment which should be near 67th he was just reaching the top of the hill near 64th when a gray sedan sped along heading downtown there were running boards on it and behind the wheel sat the slim young man who given chase to hawks before 
Hawks tried to duck, but the sedan was already braking and swinging back. It was beside him before he could realize more than the old clamor of his brain, telling him to run, that he couldn't escape. The car matched his speed, and the driver leaned far to the right. Will Hawks, the young man called. How about a lift? The smile was pleasant, and the voice was casual, as if they were old friends. There was no gun in the man's hand. It might have been any honest offer of a ride. Hawks braced himself, just as a patrol car turned into the avenue ahead. He opened his mouth to scream, but his vocal cords were frozen. The young man followed his eyes to the patrol car and frowned. Then the gray sedan lifted smoothly upward to a height of twenty feet, turned sharply in midair, lifted again, and seemed to make a smooth landing on the top of a huge garage building. There was no roar of jets and no evidence of any means of propulsion. The patrol car went down the avenue heading for the diner. The officers inside apparently had missed the whole affair. Hawk's cowardly legs suddenly came unfrozen. He was conscious of them churning madly. With an effort, he got partial control of himself managed to focus on the house numbers there were no watchers outside the number he wanted though they could have been in the rooms across the street he had no choice now he leapt up the stairs and into the hallway his eyes darted around spotting a door that led out to the side probably into an alley he drew himself together hiding behind the stairs but there was no further pursuit for the moment the fear that had seemed to come before each attack was missing. Maybe it meant he was safe for a moment, though it hadn't warned him of the car the young man was driving. Heat rays! Levitation! Hawks dropped to his knees as fatigue and reaction caught up with him again. But his mind churned over the new evidence. As a mathematician, he was sure such things could not exist. If they did, there would have been extension of math well in advance of the perfection of the machines, and he'd have known of it as speculative theory, at least. Yet, without such evidence, the devices apparently existed. The police weren't in on it, that much was certain. It was more than a hunt for a criminal. What had been going on during the months he had missed? His mind shuttled over the spy thrillers he had seen. If some nation had the secrets, and he had discovered them. But the heat ray would never have been used openly then. They wouldn't tip their hand. Anyway, the Cold War was still going on, and that would have been pointless when any nation had such power. And if the secret belonged to the United States, the young man would never have levitated to avoid police at the great risk of tipping off anyone who saw that such things could be done nothing made sense not even the crazy feeling of fear that had warned him on some occasions and failed him this last time the only explanation that was creditable was the totally incredible idea that some life alien to earth and with strange unearthly powers was after him or that he was insane he fumbled through a pack of cigarettes until he located the last one, streaked with sweat that was still pouring down his armpits, and lighted it. It was all answerless, just as his sudden need for a smoke was. The End of Chapter 2 of Pursuit by Lester Del Rey Chapter 3 of Pursuit by Lester Del Rey Hawks crushed out the cigarette and began climbing the wide stairs slowly. It was probably an ambush into which he was heading, but without this place he had no chance of resting. He stared at the numbers painted on the dirty red doors, and went on up a second flight of stairs. The number he wanted was at the end of the hall, dimly lighted. He dropped to the keyhole, but found it had been filled long ago, probably when the Yale lock was installed. He put his ear against the door and listened. There was no sound from the inside except a monotonous noise that must be water dripping from a leaky faucet. 
Finally, he climbed to his feet and reached for his keys. The third one he tried fitted, and the door swung open. He fumbled about, looking for a light switch, and finally struck a match. The switch was a string hanging down from a bare bulb. He pulled it to find that he stood inside one of the old monstrosities with which New York is filled, a combination kitchen and bathroom, with a tiny closet for a toilet in one corner. There was an icebox, a dirty stove, a Franklin heater connected to a chimney, a small sink, and a rickety table with four folding chairs. In a closet, cheap china showed. He went through that into a seven-by-twelve living room. There was a cheap radio, a worn sofa, two more folding chairs, and a big typing table. The rug on the floor had been patched together. Then he breathed more easily. Over the back of one of the chairs was a sport jacket that he recognized as his own. He jerked it up suddenly and began going through the pockets, but they had already been emptied. It didn't matter. He no longer cared why he should be in a place so totally unlike any of his usual neat habits would have led him to. It was his. Then, as he came into the bedroom, he hesitated. It was smaller than the living room, with a bed that took up half of one wall, and two dressers jammed into the remaining space. One corner held a cardboard closet, and hanging on the hook was a man's raincoat and hat, both at least five sizes too big for him. His eyes darted about to find a strange mixture of things he remembered as his and possessions that he would never have owned. On one of the dressers was a small traveling case, filled with cosmetics and appliances which only a woman would use. He jerked open the closet, and his nose told him before his eyes that it held only female clothing. Yet on the shelf his old hat rested happily. He could make no sense of it. The place looked as if several people lived in it, and yet it wasn't really fitted for anyone to spend his whole time there. There was none of the accumulation of property that would fit any permanent resident. He went out of the bedroom, passing the typewriter desk. The typewriter was an old standard Olympia, a German machine which he'd refitted with a Dvorak keyboard, which he had learned for greater efficiency. He was sure nobody else would want it. The dishes were dusty, and there was no food in the icebox. Now, though, it began to fit a place where it was convenient to stop in, but not a place to live. And perhaps he had been in the habit of lending it to others, though why he shouldn't have used his own apartment was something he still couldn't understand. It was possible there was no record of this place. He began shucking off his shirt as he went back through the living room, until the marks on the rug caught his eyes. Something heavy had rested there recently. There had been other desks about, or heavy-laden tables, and a bit of paper under the sofa could only have come from one of the complicated computing machines used in high-powered mathematics. He scanned the fragment, making no sense of it, except that it was esoteric enough to belong to any new branch of theory. For a second, the heat rays and levitation entered his head, but none of the symbols fitted such a branch of physical development. What had been going on here, and why had the machines been removed so recently that their traces still looked fresh? He shook his head and froze as a key turned in the lock. There was no time for flight. She stood in the doorway, blinking at the light before he could turn. She, of course, was the girl who he'd barely noticed when he knocked the couple down as he charged out of his apartment. Of course? He puzzled over that. He almost expected it. And yet, now that he looked more closely, he couldn't even be sure that she was the same. She wore the same green jacket, but nothing else that he could be sure of, because he had no other memory of that girl. This one was two inches shorter than he was, with dark red hair and the deepest blue eyes he had seen. She looked like an artist's conception of an Irish Colleen, except that her mouth was open half an inch, and she was studying him 
with the look of being about ready to scream who are you he forced the words out at her she shook her head and then smiled doubtfully ellen ibanez naturally you startled me but you must be wilbur hawks of course didn't you get my wire he watched her but there had been no stumbling over his name and no effort to make it sound too casual apparently the name meant nothing to her he shook his head what wire then he plunged ahead quickly you've heard of amnesia good well i've got it partially if you can tell me anything about myself before yesterday miss i'll never be anything but he choked on that unable to finish and behind the surface emotions his mind was poised sniffing for danger there was no feeling of it though he kept telling himself alternately that she had been the girl at the door and that she obviously had not been he'd seen her before the tilt of her head that unmatchable hair you poor man her voice was all sympathy and the bag she was carrying dropped to the floor as she came over you mean you really can't remember at all not for the last seven months she seemed surprised but that was when you answered my advertisement i never saw you though you did call me and your voice sounds familiar you sent me the check and i mailed you the key that was all i must have given you references told you something again she shook her head nothing you said you were a teacher at ccny and that you were quitting and wanted a place to use for an office you didn't care what it was like that's all hawks felt she was lying but it could have been true and in his present state he probably believed everyone was other than they seemed he remembered the gray sedan rising to the roof and the cat turning inside out sickness hit at him he groped back towards a chair sinking into it he'd almost found a refuge and even hoped that he could find some of the missing past now he must have partially fainted he heard vague sounds and then she was putting something against his lips it was bitter and hot though it only remotely resembled coffee he gulped it gratefully not caring that it was sweet and black he saw the bottle of old coffee powder caked with age and heard the water boiling on the stove idly he wondered whether he'd bought that jar originally or she had then his senses snapped back thanks he muttered thickly he groped his way to his feet his head slowly clearing i guess i'd better go now she forced him back into the chair you're in no condition to leave here will hawks ugh your shoes are filthy let me help you there isn't that better whatever it is you've been doing to yourself you should be ashamed you're going straight to bed while i clean some of this up his head had sunk back on the table and everything reached him through a thick fog it wasn't right girls didn't act that way to strange men who looked as if they'd come from a bowery fight girls didn't take men's clothes off girls didn't he let her carry him into the bedroom and tried to protest as she put him between the clean sheets he stared at the view of his lavender shorts against the fresh whiteness while things seemed far away he'd played with a girl named ellen once when he was eleven and she was nine she'd had bright copper hair and her name had been what had it been not ibanez bennett that was it ellen bennett he must have said it aloud she chuckled of course will though i never thought you'd be the same will hawkins i knew it when i saw the scar on your shoulder where you cut yourself sliding down our cellar door go to sleep sliding down into clouds of sleep sleep she drugged him something in the coffee he jerked up reaching for her but she ducked aside drawing on the tops of a pair of frilly pajamas ellen you Shh! she pulled a robe on over the pajamas and lay down outside the blankets Shh! well you have to sleep you're so tired so sleepy her voice was soothing 
and the fingers along the base of his neck was relaxing he reached out a last inquiring finger of doubt for the feeling of danger but couldn't find it this was as wrong as the other things had been wrong but his mind let go and he was suddenly asleep he awoke slowly with a thick feeling in his mouth drugged and the sense of danger had failed him again he swung over sharply reaching for her but she was gone his clothes lay beside him neatly pressed and he grabbed for them there was a pair of socks too large but better than none his muscles felt wrong as he began dressing but the feeling wore away the clock said less than two hours had passed if she'd put a drug in the coffee it must have been one to which he was less sensitive than average she'd probably never suspected that he would waken a trace of fear struck through him but it was weaker than before and it seemed normal enough under the circumstances he fumbled over the shoelaces then grabbed up his coat she'd bring them back maybe they'd used her as a spy but he couldn't understand why she'd bothered to press his clothes and the apartment still puzzled him even if her story was true it simply isn't the sort of place where a girl like her would live nor was it fixed as she might have arranged a place even allowing for what he might have done to it in seven months he reached automatically for the lock in the dim hall realizing his hand knew the door whatever else was true then he went out and down the stairs he heard a babble of kids voices part in english part in some sort of spanish that meant that things were normal to the casual observer along the street but he knew it was poor evidence that things really were as they should be he stood in comparative darkness in the hall staring out nothing was wrong so far as he could see he had to risk it hawks shoved past the women on the steps and headed down west end trying not to seem in a hurry his eyes turned up to the roof of the garage but he could see nothing there he'd half expected that the slim young man would be parked up on the roof waiting then the fear began mounting slowly he jerked around quickly scanning the street for a second he thought he saw the slim figure but it was only a back turned to him and it disappeared into a barber shop probably someone else the fear mounted a little and he found his steps quickening he cut around the corner where men were crowded into a little restaurant he was heading into a dead-end street but there was an alley leading from it he had to keep off the main streets footsteps sounded behind him he moved faster and the footsteps also speeded up he slowed and they kept on then they were nearly behind him just as he reached the alley and jerked back into it grabbing for a broken bottle he had spotted will it was a gasping wheeze will for god's sake it's only me i know everything your amnesia let me explain it stopped him he held the bottle carefully as a fat figure of an old man stepped slowly around the corner fear written on every aged wrinkle it was the man he'd stumbled into when he dashed out of his apartment but the fear there matched his own so completely that he dropped the bottle the other man stood trembling gasping for breath then he gathered himself together though his pudgy hands still clenched tightly showing white knuckles will he repeated you must believe me i know about you i want to help you if there's any help for you god forgive us both and god have mercy on earth it's worse than you can believe and different it's horror washed over the old man's face he stood fighting with himself hawks felt his own back hairs lift and he drew back for a second the fat man seemed to waver before him as if his body was only a projection then it quieted it almost had me for a second he turned back to hawks trying to control the quivering muscles in his face but his victory was still incomplete when he suddenly leapt up get back will oh god oh god he leapt outward his fat old legs pumping savagely then the air seemed to quiver where he had been there was only a dark cloud of smoke spreading outwards in a rough equivalent of his shape a spurt of steam leapt upward savagely and the smoke seemed darker 
it began to drift on the air touching a building and left a spot of smudginess before it drifted on getting thinner with each gust of wind it was as if every atom of his body had suddenly disassociated itself from every other atom hawks found his fingernails cutting his palms and there was blood flowing from his bitten tongue he heard a hacking moan in his throat he struggled against something that seemed to be holding him down and then leapt at least ten feet to land running the alley was twisted and narrow he shot down it and around the corner an ice house stood there and he barely avoided the loading trucks he was back near the apartment building where he'd found the girl and he doubled to a door that showed it seemed to be locked but somehow he got through it he seemed to melt through the door though he wasn't sure if his lunge smashed it or whether his fingers had found the latch in time he ducked around loose hanging electrical wires under twisted pipes and across a pile of coal around the hot water heater he twisted and turned and came into complete darkness and halt short listening the fear was going and there were again no sounds of pursuit but he couldn't be sure he'd heard no sounds when the fat man had left out but they had been there silently and thickly he cursed to find a man who seemed to be his friend and who knew about him and then to have them kill that man with such horrible efficiency before he could learn what it was all about he gagged in the darkness almost fainting again then slowly it was too much for the moment he could run no more and nothing seemed to matter he understood his sudden bravado no better than the unnatural cowardice that had been riding his shoulders but he shrugged and moved forward the dark passage led out to the steps that carried him up to the sidewalk in front of the building ellen ibanez or bennett was less than five feet from him her eyes were fixed firmly on his face end of chapter three of pursuit by lester del rey chapter four of pursuit by lester del rey she seemed surprised but tried to smile i thought i left you asleep will she said in a tone that was meant to be bantering what's the matter the fuse blow he accepted the excuse for his presence in the basement yeah it did you left the iron on i wondered what happened to you nothing just shopping there wasn't a bit of food in the place and i must say will you aren't much of a housekeeper i bought pounds of soap he followed her up the stairs and his key opened the door he was still operating on the general belief that they'd be least likely to spot him where they'd already found him once if the girl had tipped them off then they had it figured that he'd run off and probably wouldn't be back he hoped so at any rate she was talking too briskly and she was too careful not to mention that the iron was cool with his cord wrapped neatly around the handle he offered no explanation but let her babble on about the strange coincidence of his being will hawks and how she had almost forgotten the childhood days how come the ibanez he asked finally stage name i tried to make a go of musicals but it wasn't my line i found but the name stuck and where'd you learn how to drug coffee that way she changed expressions there was even a touch of a twinkle in her eye waitress in a combination bar and restaurant you needed the sleep will and i guess i still feel as much a mother to you as i did when you used to get hurt so long ago she had things out of the bags now and he saw that she had been doing a lot of shopping there had still been time enough to call the slim young man though or he suddenly realized the fat man he had no more reason to believe her an enemy than a friend then he corrected that if she'd known enough to call the fat man and had been his friend she could have told him things she denied knowing anything though he couldn't understand why he trusted her and yet somehow he did even if he knew she'd called them he would still have to trust her he was sure now that she was lying 
and that she had been the girl at the door but that meant she'd been with the fat man and the fat man had seemed to be his friend or had the man been sent to lure him out but miscalculated and gotten only what had been meant for him his head was spinning and he gave up he was a fool to trust her simply because the fear feeling subsided around her but he had nothing better to do than to follow his hunches and then try to play the odds as best he could cigarettes she said handing him a pack of his brand and for me shoe dye your shoes need it and i couldn't find a shoe store i did get a shirt though and a tie you'll find a hat in that bag size seven and a quarter he nodded gratefully and went in to change his old shirt had caught most of the cat's blood and he needed a fresh one there were a couple of spots on his trousers but they'd do and the sports jacket matched well enough he daubed the dye onto his shoes one of the combined polish and dye things cold cuts all right she asked and he called back a vague answer that seemed to satisfy her he was staring at the shoe dye it worked fairly well when he experimented he daubed it into his hair with a wisp of cotton his hair began to mat down but he found that combing it out as he went along removed the worst of the wax and still left some of the color it worked better than it should have done he found a bottle of something that smelled of alcohol and belonged in her cosmetics and began removing most of the mess by being careful he got the wax and most of the dye smell off while leaving his hair darker better wash up she called there was a razor among the things she had bought he daubed some of the dye on his upper lip where the stubble of a mustache was showing it was easier there if it didn't wash off in soap and water some of it did but when he finished shaving he felt better it wouldn't pass close inspection but he now seemed to have darker hair and the dye had exaggerated the little beginning of a mustache enough to make some changes in his appearance he waited for her to comment but she said nothing he waited for her questions about what he was going to do and her explanations that of course he couldn't stay there she merely went on talking idly while they ate it didn't fit finally he stood up and began taking down the rope that was strung up over one end of the room to be used as a clothesline he supposed she looked up at that what you can fight if you want to he told her or you can save yourself the headache of being knocked out take your choice people don't pay much attention to screams in a place like this and i'm not going to harm you if you'll take it easy you mean it her eyes were huge in her face and there was a touch of fright now she gulped visibly and then seemed to go limp all right will in the bedroom he nodded and she went ahead of him she didn't struggle until he was about to gag her then she drew her head aside there's money in my bag if you're going out he swore hotly and sickly if she'd only act just once as a normal female should maybe irma had been a hysterical cold-blooded fool but she couldn't have been that much different from other women even the books indicated ellen should be anything but so damn cooperative if you'll tell me what's going on i'll still let you go he suggested drawing her hands tighter together i can't will i don't know he had to believe her he knew she was telling the truth at least to some extent and that made it so much worse he bound the gag over her mouth as gently as he could and closed the door behind him her big eyes haunted him as he turned to the telephone the information girl at ccny could only tell him that wilbur hawks had resigned abruptly seven months before and no one knew where he was they had heard he was doing government research he snorted at that it was always the excuse but nobody knew anything he tried a few other numbers and gave up nobody knew and nobody seemed to react to his name any differently from what they would have done had he remained a quiet professorish man minding his own business instead of being chased by he couldn't complete that 
the idea was still too fantastic even if there were alien life forms that had subtly invaded earth why should they pick on him what good could a little unimportant mathematician do them particularly if they had the powers he already knew they possessed it was a poor answer though not harder to believe than that any group on earth could suddenly come up with miracles anyhow men knew enough already to be pretty sure that mars and venus wouldn't have creatures that could invade earth and the other planets were hopeless perhaps from another star but that would mean violating the theories of mass increase with the speed of light and he was not ready to accept that yet this time he went out of the building without looking first it could do no good they could hide from him he knew and he would only call attention to himself by looking around with the change in appearance he might get by he moved rapidly up broadway where he found a little clothing store and a ready-made suit that nearly fit him the tailor there seemed unconcerned when he insisted the cuffs be turned up at once and that he wanted to wear it immediately it took nearly an hour but he felt safe for a change the five and ten furnished a pair of heavy rimmed glasses that seemed to have blanks in them and he decided he might get by there was no evidence of pursuit he caught a cab and headed for the library ellen had been well healed suspiciously so for a girl who lived in a cold water flat like that he'd peeled fifteen tens from her wallet and there'd been more not to mention the twenties his conscience bothered him a bit but he was in no position to worry too much the library was still the puzzle of the ages to him he'd used it half his life and still found it impossible to guess why such a building had been chosen but eventually he found the periodical room and managed to get through the red tape enough to be given a small table with a stack of newspapers and magazines the mathematics magazines interested him most he poured through them looking for a single hint of the things he had seen einstein's work with gravity stood out but no real advances had come from it it was still a philosophical rather than an actual attack on physics as beautiful as a new theology and about as hard to utilize he skimmed through the pages but nothing showed no real advance had been made since his memory blanked out except for one paper on a variable star which was interesting but unhelpful he threw them aside in disgust he knew that it was useless to look in other languages work couldn't be done without some first stages that would be reported and any significant new theory would be picked up and spread science wasn't yet completely under political wraps for a second he stopped as he came to a paper bearing his byline then he grimaced it was an old one just published his attempt to find how the phenomenon of poltergeist could be fitted into the conservation of energy and his final proof that the whole business was sheer rubbish it would be nice to be able to get back to life where he could fool around with such learned jokes the newspapers beginning with the last day he could remember were almost as barren of results there was a story of the cold war without the strange overtones that should be there if any of the major powers where all the major scientists would tend to be had found something new he'd studied the statistical analysis of mob psychology at times and felt sure he could spot the signs he skimmed on without results until he finally came to the current paper this he read more carefully there was no mention of him but he found something on the fat man it was a simple follow-up to the story about the scientist who turned himself in at bellevue the man had mysteriously disappeared three hours later there was a picture the face of the fat man with Professor Arthur Meinzer, under it. It didn't help. Hawks shoved the magazines and papers back and went through the series of halls and stairs that led him to the main reference room, inconveniently located on the top floor. He found the book he wanted and thumbed rapidly through it. Meinzer was listed on the bottom of page 972, 
but as he looked for 973, a pile of ashes dribbled onto the floor. There was no use. They'd gotten here ahead of him. He made one final attempt. He called the college and asked for Meinzer, to find that nobody even knew the name. He knew they were lying, but he could do nothing about that. Maybe it was only because of the publicity, or maybe someone, or something, had gotten to them first. Fear was growing with him as he came out on the street. He ducked into a crowd, and headed slowly into a corner drugstore, trying to seem inconspicuous, but the fear mounted. They were near. They would get him. Run. Go. He fought it down, and found that it was weakened either by his becoming used to it, or because the urgency was less than it had been. He ducked into a phone booth and called the newspaper, keeping his eyes on both entrances to the store. It seemed to take forever to locate the proper man there, but finally he had his connection. "'Mine, sir?' the voice said with a curious doubtfulness. "'Oh, hey, mister, that story's dead. Call up! The telephone melted slowly, dropping into a little cold puddle on the floor. Hawks had felt the tension mounting, and he was prepared for anything. Now he found himself on the street, darting across 42nd Street, against the light, without even remembering having left the booth. He stole a quick glance back, to see people staring at him with open mouths. He thought he saw a slim figure in grey tweeds, but he couldn't be sure and there were probably thousands of such men in New York. He ducked into a bank, wormed his way around the various aisles, and out the back entrance. A cab was waiting there, and he held out a bill. I'm late, buddy. Penn Station? The cab driver took the bill and the hint and darted out just as the light was changing. Penn Station was as good a place to try to get lost from pursuit as any. Hawks examined his wallet, considered trying to get a train out, but he'd used up nearly all he had taken from Ellen. And all his careful disguise had proved useless. They weren't fooled, and this business of dodging was wearing thin. By now, they'd know his habits. He drew out a coin, flipped it. It came up heads. He frowned, but there was nothing else to do. He moved down the ramp toward the subway that would carry him back to 66th and Broadway. He was probably walking into their trap by now, but the coin was right. He had to free Ellen. If they got him, it couldn't be much worse for him. Then he shuddered. He couldn't know whether it would be worse for his country, or even his world. He couldn't really know anything. The End of Chapter 4 of Pursuit by Lester Del Rey Chapter 5 of Pursuit by Lester Del Rey It was growing dark as he walked down 66th, eyeing every man suspiciously, and knowing his suspicions would do no good. He was still trying to think, though he knew his thoughts were as useless as his suspicions. If he could remember, his mind came up sharply against leaving Irma and taking out the mail. Then it went abruptly blank. What had been in the letter? It had been from a professor. It might have been from Professor Meinzer. That would tie in neatly. But Meinzer was dead, and he couldn't remember. They'd stripped him of his memory. How? Why? Were they trying to prevent his getting information to others? Or were they trying to get something from him? What could he know? He dabbled with ESP mathematically but now he found himself wondering if it could exist. Could they be tracking him by some natural or mechanical ability to read his mind? He strained his own mind to find a whisper of foreign thought outside his brain. He drew a blank, of course, as he'd expected. There were no answers. They could play with him like a cat juggling a mouse, letting him almost learn something, and then, always, they arrived just in time to prevent his success. Put a rat in a maze where it can't learn the path, and it goes insane. But what good would he be to anyone 
if they drove him insane and why bother with all that when they could silence him as well by killing him he'd forgotten to watch and it was surprising to find his feet on the steps of the apartment building he jerked back and bumped into someone sorry the words came from behind him automatically and he turned to see a slim young man stepping aside for a second their eyes met squarely a row of teeth flashed in a brief smile as the man started around him guess i was thinking i should have watched where i was going the man went on down the street and turned in at a restaurant entrance hawks lifted a foot that weighed a ton and slowly closed his mouth he'd been facing away from the street light and his face might have been hard to see yet it didn't fit the young man must have known him he blanked it from his mind he couldn't believe that it was anything but lack of recognition it was hard to see here where the other was facing the light and he was in the shadow but it still meant that they were waiting nearby he dashed up the stairs expecting a rush at both landings the normal sounds of the apartment house went on he listened at his door but he could hear nothing except the same drip that he had heard before slowly he inserted the key and went in the small bulb was still on he crept along trying to move silently on the floor that insisted on creaking the living room was as he had left it and he caught sight of ellen on the bed he spotted a mirror over one of the dressers and used it to study more of the bedroom it seemed as empty as before finally he stepped inside there was no one there but ellen and she seemed to be asleep doubled up in a position that might have made the unkind cords easier to stand she moaned slightly as he untied her gently but didn't awaken her breathing was regular and her breath had an odd muskiness of someone who had slept for several hours he found a bottle of liquor on the shelf where she had put it and rinsed out a couple of glasses it was good liquor good enough to take without mixers as they'd have to do she came awake when he called her rubbing her eyes and then her wrists where the cords had left a mark but she was smiling hi will i knew you'd come back hey not on an empty stomach you need it and so do i he told her bottoms up they were big glasses she gasped over it but she downed it and then reached for the water he had brought as a chaser she swallowed and blinked tears out of her eyes I don't usually drink he made no comment but refilled the glass the liquor had less effect on him than he'd expected though he'd always had a good head for it it took some of the edge off his worrying though she giggled suddenly and he frowned she couldn't take much on an empty stomach it seemed then he shrugged let her drink maybe if he could get her drunk he could find something out at least he might learn whether the slim young man had been there during the day like when you found your dad's cider she said and giggled again you got awful whoop, awful drunk will didn't you you were so funny she was trying to be careful with her words already she slid around doing things that brought more honestly beautiful thigh into the light than will had seen in ten years he reached to adjust her dress and she giggled again sliding against him you kissed me then willie remember bet you don't remember he began it coldly deliberately if he could work on her emotions enough he'd crack the wall of evasion and lies somehow he reached for her calculating what would arouse her without causing any shock to bring her back to her senses he hadn't counted on the quickness of her response nor the complete acceptance of his right with which he took it liquor had reduced her to the stage of a little girl who completely trusted her companion she seemed as unconscious of her body as a child might be instead of protesting she reached down and began unfastening the buttons on her dress it's your turn now willie put you to bed last night you put me to bed tonight then you're going to kiss me good night nighty 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 night he felt like a heel at first then he began to feel like a man 
any man around a beautiful girl half undressed and getting more so she slipped under the sheets tossing out the last of her clothing and crooning happily gonna kiss me good night willie nighty night he yanked the pull cord savagely cutting off the light and fumbling in the darkness after what seemed hours of awkwardness he slid in beside her feeling her arms go around him in complete acceptance to hell with them they could chase him some other time he pulled her to him while his blood beat in his neck and he began to lose any conscious volition of what he was doing he drew her tighter while a great clot of emotion set fire to his brain he cold beyond anything he had known bit at him a tremendous pressure within him seemed about to force him to explode outward and the shock jerked him into full awareness in a split second he'd swung his eyes from the great jagged landscape on which he stood up an impossible range of mountains that were all harsh blacks and cold whites to the cold black sky in which the stars were blazing specks without a flicker he saw the earth above him bigger than the moon had ever been and with the dim outlines of continents showing through the soft stuff that must be clouds he was on the moon and naked without air almost at once something clapped down around him and the pressure let up while heat seemed to leap into the rocks under his feet and make them comfortable he gulped down the air that somehow seemed to stay close to him instead of evaporating into the vacuum the moon now they had him fear blazed in him a stark unreasoning terror that was like a physical thing run but you can't run they've got you you can't escape the light blotted out and then snapped on more strongly he stood in the kitchen of the cold water apartment still naked with bits of chalky dust between his toes he had no time for reason his brain seemed to have jumped over a hurdle and come down in a puddle beyond foul with the stuff it had found there he heard ellen shriek and then cry out again he lurched into the bedroom while she let out another gurgling cry as the light showed him in the doorway she came out of the bed leaping for him calling his name cold sober but he wanted none of her act he shook her off you damn alien you filthy monster disguised as a girl when you get in a spot where i'm sure to find you out you have a cute trick up your sleeves but it won't work you can send me back there back to the rest of your kind from wherever they came but you won't fool me into thinking you're human again you can't pass one test he wouldn't be fooled into thinking it was a dream either he had been physically on the moon the very dust on his feet proved that they might drive him insane but they wouldn't do it that way she was crying now gasping out words that he only half heard i'm human will oh i'm human then prove it come in here and prove it she cried again at that and he pulled her down with him but slowly her crying quieted he awoke slowly with the sunlight streaming in the windows and reached for her he owed her more apologies than one though he wasn't too sorry about most of it she had proven herself human and virginally so her complete surrender still left something warm inside him where only the madness and the fear had been before then he jerked upright as he found her gone he cursed himself for a fool and listened for a stir and bustle from the kitchen but there was none he was getting used to dressing with a feeling of dire pressure driving him on he finished rapidly and yanked the bedroom door open just as he heard the outer lock click she was coming in with a bottle of cream and a package of sausages as he reached the kitchen and there was a smile tucked into the corner of her mouth and this time he knew she wouldn't have betrayed him yet the fear increased in him he darted past her as she leaned to kiss him heading for the door the room seemed to quiver the hall was filled with a faint golden haze he had to get out he jerked backwards caught her hand and pulled her ellen we've got to get out 
It was a half-articulated shout, and she resisted, but he began dragging her after him. Something fumbled at the lock, and the key slipped into it. The door opened. Hawks didn't know what kind of alien he expected. He knew that men could never have thrown him to the moon and back, not in another thousand years. It had to be a monster. But he should have known that monsters here came in human form. They have to. The fear rose to a shriek in his brain, and then died down as a human form entered. It was too normal, too familiar. A medium-sized man, dressed in a suit as inconspicuous as his own, wearing a silly little mustache that no outland monster should ever wear. The creature jumped in, slammed the door behind it. Stay there. You can't risk it outside now. We've got to... Hawks hit the figure with his shoulder in the best football fashion he could muster. It could try, but it couldn't keep him and Ellen here to be burned in their heat-ray bath or treated to whatever alien tortures they had in mind. He felt his shoulder hit, and he knew he'd missed. It was an arm that he struck against, and the arm brought him upright, while a second arm drew back and came forward with a savage right to his jaw. He went out with a dull plopping sound in his brain. Then, slowly, with an ache came out of the blackness and the beginning of sound. He was fighting out of the unconsciousness, fighting against time and the monster who tried to steal Ellen. But Ellen's hands were on his head, and an ice-cold towel was wet against his forehead. Will! Will! He groaned and sat up. The other, alien or human, was gone. Where? he began. She was trying to help him to his feet, and he got up groggily, with his head beginning to clear. He just ran out, Will! Ellen was crying this time almost silently, with the words coming out between shakes of her shoulders. Will, we've got to get out. We've got to. The men are coming for you. They'll be here any minute. And it's wrong. It won't work. Oh, Will, hurry. Men? Men are coming? He'd almost forgotten that it could be men who were after him. I called them, Will. I thought I had to. But it won't work. Will, do anything you like, but get out. They are fools. They... He opened the door and peered out the doorway into the hall, which seemed quiet. He'd been a fool again. He'd trusted her for some reason, as if a body and loyalty had to go together. They'd been smart, picking a virgin for the job. It must have cost them plenty, unless they'd twisted her mind somehow. Maybe they could do it, but he knew that whatever they looked like, it couldn't be real men who'd meet him out there. Why? he asked, and was surprised at the flatness of his voice. She shook her head. Because I'm a fool, Will. Because I thought they could help you, until he came. And besides, I'm still in love with you, even if you've forgotten me. But the fear inside him was drowning out her words and the golden haze was faint in the air again. Okay, he said finally. Okay, don't burn her too, now that she's done your dirty work. I'm coming. The haze disappeared slowly, and he started down the stairs, still holding her hand. End of Chapter 5 A Pursuit by Lester Del Rey Chapter 6 of Pursuit by Lester Del Rey There were men with guns in the street. He'd heard two shots as he came down the stairs and had shoved Ellen behind him, but it was silent now. People with dazed, frightened faces were still darting into the houses, leaving the street to the men with the guns. Hawks marched forward grimly, perversely, stripped of fear, even though he was sure some of the men out there were monsters and others were their dupes. He tapped one of the men on the shoulder. Okay, here I am. The girl goes free. The man spun around as if mounted on a ball bearing and pulled by strings. The gun fell from his hand. His emotion-taught face loosened suddenly, seemed to run like melted wax, 
and congealed again in an expression of utter idiocy he gargled frothily and then screamed high and shrill like a tortured woman suddenly he was a lunging maniac tearing up the street now the others were running some toward cars some towards the corners running flat and desperately on the flat of their feet without any spring in their motions hawks jerked his eyes down toward the big gas storage tanks where most of them had been and the glow that had been in the corner of his vision was gone men seemed to be coming out of a trance they were breaking away forgetting about their guns and fleeing three men alone were left hawks ducked back into the hall of the apartment dragging ellen with him the glass of the door seemed somewhat dirty but it made a dim mirror he could see the slim young man and two others still there the two men darted into a waiting car and the leader turned up the street running smoothly toward the apartment house hawks could make no sense of it unless it was another of the seeming tricks designed to drive him out of his mind he had decided he was one of the rats in the maze that didn't go crazy the pressure could drive him somewhat mad but it couldn't keep him that way he didn't wait to see what had happened or whether the sirens that were sounding now were reinforcements for the men with guns or the police he didn't bother with the slim young man any more they'd apparently used their dupes to frighten out the people and then scared off the dupes the poor humans who didn't know what it was all about now two of the three were gone and the third monster was coming for him he'd escaped before but sooner or later they'd catch him once they were sure he wouldn't be driven insane or was this the beginning of insanity a delusion of power a feeling that he could escape he could never know if it was he had to assume that he was sane he crouched back behind the stairs while the young man in the gray tweeds dashed up them then he headed out into the street the siren was near now and tardily he realized that the siren might herald the coming of the real monsters it was as easy to look like a cop as any other human he jerked open the door of the nearest car pulled ellen in and kicked the motor to life he gunned away from the curb tossing it into second and twisted around the corner straight toward the siren that was nearest at the last minute he jerked into a side street to let the police car shoot by never run from a tiger run toward it it sometimes works and it's no worse the car was a big one and the motor purred smoothly he glanced down at the dash and frowned there was no key in the switch for a second he stared at it then grinned he'd picked the monster's car apparently they'd done a neat job of duplicating but they didn't need all the safeguards that humans used and the switch had obviously been a dummy he looked at the buttons on the dash wondering what would make it levitate but he had no desire to test it nor to stay in an auto which could probably be traced so easily he braked to a halt outside the subway and led ellen down we're down to the last hole he told her as the train pulled out of the station how much money do you have she shook her head and held up her arm i left it will they were beyond the last hole then he realized now that as long as they'd been in the crowded apartment house filled with other humans it had proved a tough nut to crack for the aliens but on the move maybe we have a chance he told her if humans were after me it'd be tough but these things have to avoid the police she looked at him misery on her face there are no aliens will those men you saw were fbi men that's where i reported you you he stared at her but she was serious but there's nothing about me in the papers ellen she pointed across the aisle spread over two columns on the front page an older picture of him showed plainly and even at a distance the heading was boldly legible hundred thousand dollar reward for this man he stared at the figure twice unbelieving he was no longer alone against a small group of humans or aliens now every living human on the face of the planet would be looking for him he could feel their hot breath on his neck feel eyes staring at him through the papers fear began to rise in him 
to be halted as the train ground to the new station. Ellen jerked him out, and he moved with her. It wasn't safe to be too long with one group, until they began to wonder and compare faces. But what? She shook her head. Nothing, Will. I don't know. What can we do? He'd been wondering while they moved quietly through the groups of people and up the stairs. There was no place left. He had about a dollar in change, and that would be of no use to them. They'd have to dig a hole in the ground and pull it over them. It jogged his memory, and he grabbed her hand and jerked open the door of a cab that was waiting for a light. He barked out an address, the corner of 10th Avenue and one of the streets below the 20s. The driver got into motion, not bothering to look back. The address was near enough to where Hawks wanted to be, an old warehouse with a loading platform. He'd played there as a kid, climbing back under it and digging holes down into the damp, soft earth, as kids have always done. He'd been by there since, and it had remained unchanged. Sooner or later the aliens would locate them, but it would give Ellen and him a chance to rest, perhaps long enough for him to waylay someone at night and steal enough for them to leave town. That wouldn't help much but it was all he had left to count on. He saw trucks loading there as he paid the cab driver. His heart sank abruptly until he studied the way the big trailer was parked. If he watched carefully, he could slip under it from the side, and there was a chance he wouldn't be seen. He darted beneath it. Luck, for once, was with him as he drew Ellen under the trailer and the platform. The old opening was covered with rubble, but he scraped it aside and found the entrance barely big enough for them to wiggle through. Then they were back in a dark pocket under the back of the platform, barely big enough for them to sit upright. The hole had seemed bigger when he was a kid. Outside he heard a boy's voice yelling, Monster attacks cops! Monster kills five cops! Extra! Paper! Now he was a monster to be shot on sight, probably. I shouldn't have brought you into this, Ellen, he said bitterly. I should have left you. You don't even know what's going on. You haven't the faintest idea. If it were just humans, as you think. She snuggled against him in the coldness of the little cave. Shh! I got you into it. I ratted on you, Scarface. But he couldn't reply to her attempt at humor. There was no fear now, not even the relief of fear. He felt brave for a few minutes back in the hallway of the apartment. Now the chips were down and sunk. They were here, in a dank hole, without food and without a chance, while all the world searched for him to kill him, and while still unknown aliens with unknown reasons played out their little game with consummate skill and would inevitably locate him. It might take them a day. They probably would do nothing to him until night came and the warehouse street was deserted. Ten more hours. If he only knew what they wanted of him, or why, if he could remember. He sat there, numbed within himself. Ellen leaned her head forward into his lap, and he began stroking her hair softly. He'd have liked to have a chance with her. One night wasn't enough for a whole life. He reached down to draw her face to his. Fear hit him as something rustled behind him. He tried to turn and look, but his neck refused. The fear grew to panic and swelled higher as the golden haze began to sweep over the little cave. Then his muscles snapped his head around sharply. The slim young man was crawling toward them, holding something that looked like a flashlight. Behind it, he could see the tense lips drawn back over clenched teeth. The man wasn't smiling now. He opened his mouth just as the thing like a flashlight sprang into light. No time seemed to elapse, but suddenly Ellen and the young man were both gone, and he sat in a dark hole, alone. He let out an animal cry and dashed out, crawling through the opening, and kicking the rubble back as he went. He slipped out and under the trailer, but there was no sign. They'd taken her and left him unconscious. He groaned, trying to figure. He'd always gone back to the same place to hide since he'd found it. 
They must expect him back there. They'd take Ellen there and wait for him, drugging her, changing her mind, setting her up to use against him. The first time hadn't worked, but they'd try again. It had to be that. If they hadn't taken her there, he had no way of finding her, and he had to find her. He began running down the street, forcing himself to believe she was there. Then he slowed. It would be no good to have them all notice him here on the street. Somebody might recognize him then. He turned around, walking back to the bus stop. There were still two dimes and a nickel in his pocket. He hunched down on the seat of the bus that seemed to crawl up 10th Avenue, but no one noticed him in the almost empty vehicle. He got off at 66th and forced himself to walk to West End, up that to the apartment house. Men were drawing up in cars, men with guns in their hand. He made a final dash for the apartment entrance. This must be the real show, for which the other had been only a dress rehearsal to throw him off balance. They could wait. He fumbled with the lock until he finally got it open. Then he jumped in, slamming the door shut behind him. Ellen stood there, and the creature that had assaulted him before was pawing at her. But he had no time for the monster. Stay there, he shouted at her. You can't risk it outside now. We've got to. He saw she wasn't listening to him. He had to get rid of the creature somehow, if he could get it far enough away from her. Then they'd find some way to get outside without going out through the entrance. The creature sprang at him awkwardly. His arm darted down to catch one shoulder, and his right hand swung back and up. There was a savage satisfaction in seeing the creature crumble. Ellen's voice reached him. Will! Will! Before I go crazy! You're free, he told her. Go down the fire escape and leave that here. I'll get rid of them out front somehow. He shut the door again and went down. The words had sounded brave enough but there had been no courage behind them. Fear still rode him, like the little golden haze that again hovered over him, showing they had spotted him. He walked out, with it thick around him, rising slowly in temperature. They had him, but Ellen might get away. He walked down the steps, his hands up. They drew back, surprise and something else on their features, their eyes on the haze that surrounded him. They were shouting, but he couldn't hear the words over the shrieks of people along the street, rushing inside, or trying to drag their kids to safety. Hawks doubled his legs under him and leapt. He was still attacking the tiger. The slim young man, down by the big gas storage tanks, directing the new crop of human dupes. His charge carried him there, while the young man slipped aside. Then someone fired a gun. He heard the young man yell hoarsely, No shooting! Stop it! Damn it! No shooting! They weren't paying any attention to the shouts. Bullets ticked against the tanks. Hawks ducked frantically, physical fear knotting his stomach. Suddenly, he seemed to jerk upwards, to find himself suspended in midair, fifty feet off the ground, just above the tanks. He stared down at the men, dizzy with the height but no longer surprised by anything. They were pointing their guns upward while the young man leapt about among them. Bullets were splatting out, though none came near Hawks. They seemed to ricochet off the air a few feet in front of him. The slim young man drew back, and now the rubble and stones along the street began to lift and to drive savagely at the attackers. A gale swept along the street, though Hawks could feel no breath of air and the force of it was enough to knock most of them down. They got up and began running, dashing away from the super-science that the young man now seemed bent on turning against his own troop of dupes, now that they were out of control. Hawks came drifting downward. He started to cry out in fear until he noticed that the ground was coming up to him slowly and that he was slipping sideways. He landed on a street back of the tanks, as gently as a feather. Surprisingly, everyone was gone when he risked a glance back at the scene of the fight. 
with the back of the slim young man just darting into the apartment house then hawks cursed as the creature came darting out with ellen behind him to leap into the car and drive off the sound of sirens grew louder and a police car swung into west end hawks straightened up slowly as it hit him it had been the same scene he'd gone through before that morning but with himself in the middle he shot a glance at the sun to see it still in the east though his memory of the day indicated that it should have been afternoon time they twisted him back through time the weapon that looked like a flashlight must have tossed him hours backwards instead of knocking him out he'd been attacking himself there in the hallway of his apartment he'd knocked himself out and the fight that he had just come through was the same fight that he had seen come to its end before now his younger self and ellen must be just fleeing toward the hideout under the loading platform with the slim young man still following if he could get there in time before the man could run off with ellen the end of chapter six of pursuit by lester del rey chapter seven of pursuit by lester del rey the paper he'd found kept the other passengers on the bus from seeing him but he was too deep in his own thoughts to read it his eyes roamed back to the story of the cop killing monster a seemingly harmless florist in brooklyn who'd suddenly gone berserk and rushed down the streets with a knife he'd been wrong in thinking it concerned him and he'd been wrong about thinking anyone would try to kill him on sight the reward notice and picture were in front of his eyes but it was a reward for information and there was a huge box that proclaimed he was not a criminal and must not be harmed or even allowed to know he was recognized the facts only confused the issue he twisted about in his mind trying to explain why the young man had left him to drift down and gone rushing into the apartment he was ready for the collecting and he'd been left uncollected the girl had said there were no aliens now he wondered she had known more than he'd found from her she'd known his brand of cigarettes even and there had been a shopping list with the lipstick on it the same type he now remembered her using he'd known her before and not just as a little girl that tied him in with mine sir who was a mystery in himself he puzzled over it the things that had happened to him had always been preceded by violent emotion instead of followed by it usually it had been fear but sometimes some other emotion as had been the case just before he was suddenly shifted to the moon whenever he seemed on the verge of discovering something or emotional upset it hit at him did that mean he was only susceptible to the phenomenon when off balance it still didn't account for the fact that some things hadn't directly affected him at all the more he knew the less he knew he got off the bus and headed for the warehouse this time he had to wait before he could see a chance to dart under the trailer and into the entrance he noticed that the gray sedan was parked nearby he darted in they were still there he heard ellen's voice sounding as if she had been crying and then an answer from the other he felt his way carefully over the rubble working as close as he could now if he sprang a few feet must be a time jump the man's voice said doubtfully i tell you ellen those damn fools were firing at him up there in the air while you and I were still with him in the apartment. That's an angle of this psi factor stuff we hadn't expected. The voice stopped for a moment. Then it picked up again. Gratit, I wish you hadn't called the FBI on him. They got rattled when he came out looking like a saint with a halo and jumped fifty feet up to float around. Some fools started shooting, and the rest joined in. I had to he was talking about alien monsters I thought he was going crazy Dan I couldn't tell him anything I promised him I wouldn't 
and I kept my promise. But I thought enough of them might catch him somehow. Dan, can't we find him now? He needs us. Hawks lay frozen. He tried to move forward, but his body was tense, waiting for more. If something happened now... Alien monsters? Dan's voice grew bitter. It is alien, and a monster, this psi factor. The words blurred and seemed to echo and re-echo inside Hawk's head. That made twice he'd heard them mention the psi factor, the strange ability of a few human minds to perform seeming miracles. Men who had it could roll dice the way they wanted. Young girls sometimes had it before puberty and could throw heavy objects around a room without touching them. They did not even know that they were the cause of the motion, but blamed it on poltergeists. Other men caused strange accidents, fires, for instance, the old salamander legend. There'd been a piece of paper, psi equals alpha. The psi factor was the beginning of infinity for mankind. But it had been wrong. He'd changed that on the other side. It should have read, Psi equals Omega, the absolute end. He gasped hoarsely, and heard their startled voices stop while the flashlight beam swung around to pick him out of the darkness. He felt Ellen and her younger brother Dan pulling him forward into the little cave with them. He heard their voices questioning him, but his head was spinning madly under the sudden flood of memories that the missing key word had suddenly brought back. The letter from Professor Meinzer that had been about his paper on poltergeists, which the old man had seen before publication. He'd been doing research on the psi factor for the government, and he needed a mathematician, even one who could prove something that he knew wasn't true, provided the mathematics could handle his theories. Hawk's head was suddenly brimming with mental images of the seven months, while he worked on the mathematics to tie down the strange pattern of brain waves the old professor had found in the minds of those who had the mysterious psi factor. Dan had worked with them, in a little cluttered apartment, building the apparatus they needed. It was through Dan that Ellen was hired, as a general assistant and secretary. There had been only four of them, working in the deepest secrecy in the three rooms, which the government had felt were more suitable to maintain complete security than any deeply buried laboratory could have been. Ellen made a pretense of living there, and it was a neighborhood where no landlady worried about the men who went into a girl's place, provided everything was quiet. They'd succeeded, too. They had found a tiny bundle of cells that controlled the psi factor, and learned to stimulate them by artificial wave trains and hypnosis. But the small group in the top division of the government to whom they were responsible had demanded more proof. Hawks had treated himself secretly not knowing that Meinzer had done the same two days before. And both had learned the same thing. The wild talents appeared, but they couldn't be controlled. Meinzer hadn't found the security in the hospital, hard as he'd tried to find it. He'd gotten up in the middle of the night and walked through the solid wall, unable to stop until he was back with the group. Hawks had tried another way to stop the wild abilities that operated without his conscious control. He prepared a new hypnotic tape, worded to make him forget everything he knew, or even the fact that he had worked on the psi factor. He'd put in commands that would make him avoid any reference to it, so that he couldn't learn accidentally. He ordered his brain to have nothing to do with it. Then he drugged himself with a combination of opioids and hypnotics that should have knocked out a horse. Then he'd telephoned Dan to have men pick him up in an hour and keep him drugged. He turned on the tape recorder and stumbled back into the bed. He groaned as he remembered his failure. It's the ultimate, absolute alien, all right, the back of man's own mind. It's Freud's unconsciousness, or id. The psi factor is controlled by that and not by the conscious mind. And the id is a primitive beast. It operates on raw impulse, without reason or social consciousness. Every man's unconscious is back in the jungle, before civilization. And we've given that alien thing the greatest power that could exist when we wake up the psi power. 
Meinzer thought it was controlled for a while, Ellen said. He came when Dan and I called him. I went with him up to your apartment while Dan got the men to carry you away. But we couldn't reach you. Meinzer barely touched the tape recorder, then something seemed to pick us up and drive us out of the room and down the stairs. We were just going back when you came out. She shuddered, and Hawks nodded. He'd obviously used the psi factor to throw off the drugs at the first sign of anyone near him. He told them sickly what had happened to the old man. So I killed him, he finished bitterly. Dan shook his head. No, your psi factor works differently. You control heat and radiation. You can move yourself or any object in space for almost any distance. Instantly, if you want. And it seems you can do the same thing through time. But you can't disintegrate things, as Meinzer could. He had a suicide urge. We knew that before. When it got out of control again, he blew himself up, just as your dominant urge to protect yourself did all those things around you. Hawks grimaced. It wasn't pleasant to know that he'd been doing all the things he'd blamed on monsters. He'd somehow remembered that someone was supposed to come get him, and he'd run out of wild fear while his unconscious mind blasted the apartment with heat to destroy all traces. He'd blasted down the subway entrance with another bolt of energy to make his getaway. The poor cat had surprised him and had been killed. His unconsciousness gone wild had tossed Dan's car 200 feet to the roof of the garage. When it found him losing control emotionally with Ellen, it hadn't let his conscious brain give it the information it needed. It had simply thrown him completely off Earth, pulled air to him, and warmed the rocks. Then, when it found the moon unfit for life, it had thrown him back to his own world. It had tossed him two hours back in time this morning, and lifted him into the air while it pelted his enemies with rocks, and built a wall around him by throwing the bullets back instantly. And it had somehow clung to the implanted idea that he must not find out about himself. It had destroyed anything where the written word might have given him a hint, and had even melted the telephone so that he couldn't continue listening to other evidence. It had probably done a thousand other things that he couldn't even remember, whenever its wild, reasonless fear had been aroused, and it decided that he had to be protected. You should have killed me, he told them, but he knew they couldn't have done it. We had to let you sweat it out. You made us promise not to tell you anything, and we thought you might be right, Ellen told him. We thought that it might adjust after a while. All we did was try to pick you up until we knew it was impossible until sis tipped off the government men dan added hawks could imagine what their reaction had been to having a man with his power running wild he was surprised that they had bothered to make even an attempt to see that he wasn't harmed he shrugged helplessly and where does it leave us now beyond this hole in the ground the government's put about fifty specialists on the notes you and Meinzer left, Dan answered, but there was no assurance in his voice. They're trying to find some way to bring the psi factor under control of your logical, rational mind. He got to his knees and began crawling out of the little cave, while Hawks tried to help Ellen follow him. Outside, Dan knocked off the dirt from his clothes and headed for the sedan he'd somehow gotten off the roof. Hawks followed, for want of anything better to do. He knew the answers now, and he was worse off than ever. Instead of a horde of outside aliens, he had one single monster in his own skull, where he could never fight it, or even hope to escape it. The power had been meant as a hope for the world. A man who could work such seeming miracles could have ended the threat of war. He could have been the perfect spy or better at attack than a hundred hydrogen bombs that had smashed whole cities to remove a few men and weapons but now the world was better off without him so long as he was still alive there was nothing but danger from the alien monster in his head he had no idea of his limits but he was sure that it could trigger the energies of the universe to move the whole world out of its orbit 
if it seemed necessary for his personal survival. The End of Chapter 7 of Pursuit by Lester Del Rey Chapter 8 of Pursuit by Lester Del Rey Hawks leaned forward cautiously as the gray sedan moved up 10th Avenue. His finger found the gun in Dan's coat pocket, and he pulled it out stealthily. He knew that the only answer for him was suicide. He had to destroy himself, since no one else could. He propped it up, pointed it at his head, and his thumb pressed back on the trigger, further and further, until he felt sure that the smallest change would set it off. Then he waited for a rough spot in the street, or a sudden stop at a light, that would do the trick before he could stop it. The car lurched, and the gun suddenly vanished, leaving his hand empty. His responses were too quick, and his mind wasn't waiting once it knew that there was danger. He slumped back on the rear seat, trying to think. Drugs were out. He knew his system would throw them off. But he couldn't remove himself. He lifted his wrist to his teeth and bit down savagely. If he could sever an artery. Pain shot through him, and he stared down at the blood. Then the blood was gone, and the wound was closing before his eyes, until only smooth flesh remained. His mind could juggle the cells back into their original form. It would have to be sudden, complete death. And no death was that sudden. For a fraction of a second, there'd be life left, and during that split second the damage would be repaired, or he would be shifted from danger. There was no way out, unless he could pull himself to another planet, or throw himself back into the dim past. But that would take voluntary control, and he knew now that hours of effort had shown him how impossible that was. He hadn't been able to lift a crumb of bread from the table deliberately in his original test after he had treated himself. He was faced with a problem that had to be solved, and there was no possible solution that he could find. No man could face that dilemma forever without going insane. Hawks shuddered, trying to picture what would happen if he went mad, and the wild talents began operating at every whim of his crazed mind. Ellen shouted suddenly, grabbing for the wheel. Hawks felt himself tense, and began lifting from the seat of the car. But there was no visible danger, and Dan was slowing to a halt at the curb. Hawks' body dropped back slowly. Dan! Ellen was whispering hoarsely. Dan, we can't. If we take him back, they'll find him, and they'll know what he can do. They'll kill him. Eventually, they'll kill Will. Hawks started to protest, but Dan's words cut him short. You're right, sis. They'll wait their time, until he won't know when to expect it, and then they'll drop an H-bomb on him, if they have to. It's faster than any nerve impulse. He swung back to face Hawks, reaching for the door of the car. Get out, Will, and get as far away as you can. I'm not going to drive you to your death. They'll get you eventually, but I won't be the one to make it easier for them. Hawks jerked. The old fear came back suddenly. You can't escape. They'll find you. Run. Go. He screamed as the golden haze flickered again. He could wipe out the earth, but he couldn't survive then. He could move back in time, but it would only mean other dangers. No man could stay awake forever, and he was used to civilized living. The haze hesitated while the sense of danger mounted. Then it was gone, as if the beast in his head had found no answer. Suddenly the gray sedan lifted again, to a height of fifty feet above the tallest building. It shot forward, hesitated, and came down softly on a deserted side road in Central Park. His mind felt as if it were going to split. Dan and Ellen stared at him speechlessly. You can't survive alone. No power is enough by itself. They'll get you. You are your own death sentence. Run. Don't run. Hawks put his hand to his splitting skull, trying to force words through the agonies of pain, 
while slow understanding began to reach him. Dan, the scientists, get me there. Then his mind seemed to clamp down on itself, and he was unconscious. He could protect himself from almost anything, except his own brain. He was conscious of no pain, but only of irritation. There was a needle in his arm, and he removed it. He opened his eyes slowly to find himself in the center of a group of men, while a white-coated doctor stood staring at an empty hand that must have held a hypodermic. Ellen cried out suddenly and ran to him, cradling his head in her hands. He found her arm with his own hand, and stroked it slowly. "'You found the answer?' he asked. Then he nodded, while the weight that had lain on him for so long began to lift. His voice was suddenly positive. "'You found it!' One of the men pushed forward, but Dan shook his head and came over to stand beside the cot where Hawks lay. "'No, Will. They didn't find it. You did. You found what we should have known. Your unconscious mind may be a wild beast, but it isn't insane. When it was shocked into realizing that it couldn't save you by itself, it looked for help from your consciousness, and then it knocked you out, knocked itself out, until we could work on you. I guessed it, Hawks said slowly, but in that case, a psychotic with his id out in the driver's seat should become normal when they lock him up. Or, wait, maybe his unconscious is a bit insane. Maybe. But you still have to communicate with the unconscious part of the brain to make it understand that it has to surrender. And all the psychiatrists have been driving themselves crazy trying to solve that. Touché, an old man said. There was a faint sound of amusement from some of the others. But this psi factor is the means of communication. You told us that yourself, while you were undergoing our hastily improvised hypnotic education of your brain. It always has been. The minute a girl bothered with poltergeists finds she is the cause of them, they stop. It's a faint, weak channel between the consciousness and the unconsciousness, or subconsciousness, if you prefer. And yours was widened by the treatment even if it wasn't ready to work yet. We simply used your own technique to improve the relationship. All you ever needed was a longer, harder treatment than you and Meinzer had given yourselves. You just stopped too soon. Hawks dropped back comfortably into the cot. He reached out for a glass of water, lifted it to his lips, and put it back, without using his hands. He thought of his clothes, and they were suddenly on him, over the single white garment he had been wearing. Another thought took that away, to leave him normally dressed. Whether they were entirely correct or not in their theories, the psi factor was no longer wild. He had it under full control. He sat up just as three men entered the crowded room. One wore the uniform of a four-star general, but the familiar faces of the two civilians told Hawks at once that they were more important than any general could be. He was about to become officially the national arsenal and replacement for all the armies, navies, and air corps they had ever dreamed of having. He'd also become their bridge into space, their means of solving the secrets of the planets, and probably their chief historical tool, since nothing could ever be secret from him. It was going to be a busy life for him, and for others like him, who would now be carefully selected and treated. He grinned faintly as he realized that they didn't know yet just how important he was. He wasn't going to be a national resource. He'd be a world resource. This power was too great for any local political use, and no man who had it along with the full correlation of his conscious and subconscious mind could ever see it any other way. But right now, he had other pressing business. He grinned at Ellen. You don't mind a small wedding, do you? he asked. She shook her head and began to smile. He reached for her hand. This psi factor was going to be a handy thing to have around, 
with its complete control of space and time i'm taking a two-week honeymoon before we talk business he told the approaching three men but don't go away we'll be back in ten minutes honolulu looked lovely in the moonlight and june was a perfect month for a wedding the end of pursuit by lester del rey